Welcome to the Citizens Research Council of Michigan's website. I am Eric Lufer, the research, or the president now of the Citizens Research Council of Michigan. I'd like to welcome you to CRC's webinar to discuss our recently released study, Policy Options to Support Children from Birth to Age 3. This webinar is being presented by the Citizens Research Council of Michigan. CRC is a statewide nonpartisan public affairs research group. This is our 98th year of operation, a longevity we attribute to our promotion of sound public policy for state and local governments through accurate, independent, and objective research. We are a private, not-for-profit entity, and we rely on the charitable contributions of foundations, businesses, and corporations. I'd like to encourage all of you to join our circle of supporters and help us to continue to provide high-quality, independent information on important public policy topics in Michigan. Please note we are recording this webinar and we will post it on our webpage where it will be available for future viewing. Second, we have everyone but the presenters on mute, so we will not be able to hear if you speak. To ask a question, please type the question into the questions pane that should be appearing on your screen in the GoToWebinar software. You can type these questions in at any time. If you have any technical difficulties, please let us know by calling 734-542-8001. After the webinar, you will be receiving an email soliciting your feedback, and we would very much appreciate any thoughts you have. We uh, scheduled this for about an hour, but we will keep going with questions and answers as long as they are available, uh, as long as they're coming in. So please don't feel like an hour is up and just have to go, uh, we'll try to stick around for as long as there's interest. Today's webinar on early childhood issues will be presented by, by Bob Snyder, CRC's Director of, Lo of State Affairs. Bob has been with CRC for a couple of years now after working for many years with the House Fiscal Agency. So in the interest of time, let me turn it over to Bob and we can get started. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Schneider. As Eric said, I'm the Director of State Affairs here with the Citizens Research Council, and we are here today to talk about our new report, Policy Options to Support Children from Birth to Age 3. This is a report that was co-authored with our partners at Public Sector Consultants. It was released last Monday, the 17th, and if you are interested, the full report can be found online at our website, which is on our title screen here, CRC. M-I-C-H dot O-R-G. So again, today our topic is early childhood policy. And as an introduction, there's a growing consensus among scientists who study the brain and who study brain development uh, regarding the critical importance of the first years of life for a child. Uh, that early brain development that occurs from birth through age three sets the stage for the remainder of the lives of these children. Uh, the brain, that brain development depends on health nurturing relationships with caring adults. That's important to language development. Uh, those relationships are important to the critical thinking ability, the development of critical thinking in the child. Uh, those relationships are important to a development of a strong sense of self-security for the child. It's important to them. Uh, through their formative years and into their adulthood. We do know that not all children have uh, the, the benefits of, of, of those strong relationships. And research has also shown us that early intervention programs uh, can be very effective at uh, helping, uh, helping overcome uh, some of those challenges for, uh, for young children. And in particular, that early uh, intervention programs are more effective and certainly more cost efficient than later, later remediation programs uh, that might have to take their place without, uh, without such intervention. So our goal of the report uh, with our partners at Public Sector Consultants was to uh, assist policymakers and provide a bit of a roadmap for targeting resources for early, uh, early intervention programs. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the significant investments in the Great Start Readiness Program, our state's uh, pre-kindergarten program, uh, an increase of $130 million annually for that program, uh, 
uh, that provides high quality preschool for four-year-old children. Uh, this report uh, takes a look at well, what's next? If we need to, if we want to invest additional dollar resources into into early childhood programs, uh, what might be some of the best investments to make? And as such, the report tries to answer a few critical questions that policymakers will want to consider. First, how many at-risk children are out there? How many children in Michigan might need the benefits of early intervention programs? Uh, two, what programs have demonstra demonstrated the greatest promise, uh, the most bang for the buck, to, uh, and it's, uh, validated through research uh, uh, that's uh, of high quality? And, and then finally, what will they cost? Uh, what can we expect on a return uh, to our investment as a state? This report will address all three of those key questions and, and try to provide some context to policymakers for, uh, for the decision making that, uh, that they may wish to pursue. The report would not have been possible without uh, some generous financial support from a number of sponsors. Uh, the Center for Michigan uh, spearheaded the project and, uh, and helped to uh, bring along a large number of other uh, charitable foundations and uh, other uh, financial sponsors which are listed on this screen. We did want to recognize that support uh, in our webinar today. Uh, the, the project certainly would not have taken place without uh, the generosity of those organizations that you see here. So our first focus was getting a handle on need. How many at-risk uh, young children from birth to age three are out there in Michigan that might, uh, that might benefit from early intervention programs to give a guide to policymakers as to the uh, potential population uh, in need here. And, and to get to an estimate, we, did, we needed to uh, decide who it is then that, that's at risk. Our key definition uh, for at risk is uh, children with a heightened risk of falling behind their peers before they reach kindergarten or another, which ki kindergarten readiness. And we looked to research to see what factors might be correlated with uh, a lack uh, of kindergarten readiness. And we found the five that, that uh, we, uh, we talked about on the screen, both uh, shown in research to be uh, correlated with kindergarten readiness uh, and also uh, measurable for our purposes in, uh, in, in the project that, that we were undertaking. Uh, we're going to talk about each of these factors uh, in kind here and, uh, and provide some uh, numbers as to the number of children in Michigan who, who fall into these risk categories. Before we do that, just quickly on uh, the methodology we used, uh, we uh, drew on both survey research and then where uh, survey research wasn't available, other uh, outside empirical academic research uh, on the incidence of the risk factors that you just, uh, you just saw on the prior screen. Our, our primary source was the American Community Survey, a three-year sample that represented 3% of households in Michigan from, from the American Community Survey. We, uh, uh, we got information on household income and how that compared to the federal poverty level. We got information on spoken, uh, spoken language within adults in, uh, in households. And we uh, got information on educational attainment of adults in households, three of those five uh, critical risk factors. The other two factors uh, where we uh, could not get data from the American Community Survey, we looked to uh, academic research on the incidence of uh, both developmental uh, delay issues and adverse situations. So first, uh, we'll look at poverty and, and low income among uh, very young children. Our analysis of the American Community Survey data suggests there are four, uh, 465,283 children uh, aged 0 to 3 in Michigan. And looking at uh, uh, family income uh, of uh, the households that house those children, we found better in one in four, about 27.2 percent, live in families with uh, household incomes at or below the federal poverty line. Uh, and we looked at that as a narrow definition of poverty or low income. Uh, for the purposes of our report, we also looked at a slightly broader definition uh, of 185 percent of poverty level. That's the level equivalent to uh, uh, the eligibility criteria for Medicaid, also for reduced uh, school lunches, 
And if we look more broadly at, uh, at that measure of low income, we'll find roughly 47% of children age 0 to 3, uh, just over 218,000 uh, meet the definition of low income. Uh, we, we use these two measures, sort of the narrow measure and the broad measure, uh, through the rest of, uh, rest of the report as well in, uh, in looking at our risk factors. The other two risk factors that we looked, uh, looked to the ACS data for uh, were uh, non-English speaking households, and we defined that as uh, in households with parents available, no parent, or uh, if there was a separate head of the household, neither the parent or the head of the household reports in the ACS speaking English well. So no English speaking ability or uh, at least not speaking English well. Uh, and there we found about 6,774 6, children age 0 to 3 uh, lived in households with non-English speakers. And then for low educational attainment, again, we defined it uh, there as no parent or, again, the head of the household, if there was a separate head of the household, had earned at least a high school diploma or a GED. And in looking at the ACS data, we identified approximately 40,635 children that, uh, that lived in uh, such households. When you look unduplicated across all three of those factors, poverty, low income, uh, non-English speaking households, low educational attainment, you see that somewhere between 140,000 and 223,000 very young children in Michigan, 30 to 48 percent of the full population, experienced at least one of those of those three risk factors. Another important factor that we looked to, uh, that we had to look outside of the ACS data, uh, was adverse experiences, or often in the literature this is referred to as toxic stress. And there's a growing body of research that's documented uh, very long-term negative impacts of early exposure uh, in children in very severely adverse uh, situations. And we list some examples here, death of a parent, divorce, separation, perhaps a parent's incarcerated, uh, uh, having a household member with mental illness or substance abuse issues, violence in the home. Uh, research has shown that these types of toxic stress factors have enormous lifelong costs uh, for children, not only in their formative years but and, and as children, but even as adults, learning, uh, and health issues in particular, uh, also in behavioral issues. Uh, so we, uh, we tried to look at academic research on the incidence of this toxic stress, stress among young children. And as such, we looked to a 2013 report put out by the nonpartisan Child Trends uh, Research Organization. They looked at data from the National Survey of Children's Health try to estimate the incidence of these adverse experiences. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this screen shows some of the results from, from that research among very young children, 0 to 5 years old. Uh, they found that just over 5% of those young children had experienced at least three or more of those adverse experiences that we listed on the prior page. They also found on the right-hand side of the slide that uh, those, the number uh, in the proportion experiencing uh, adverse toxic stress uh, varied with family income. For the very poor families, those living at or below the poverty level, uh, about 13.8% of those children had at least three or more adverse experiences. And this is 0 to 18, uh, all children now on that, uh, on that side of the page. Above 200% of the federal poverty level uh, was much lower, less than half, uh, uh, less than half the proportion, about 5.9%. And then uh, lastly, we look to research on developmental delays and disabilities and the incidence of these developmental issues among children uh, in the United States. We found two good uh, research sources in this regard. A 2011 study published in the journal Pediatrics uh, took data from the National Health Interview Surveys and found an overall prevalence of developmental disabilities at about 13.8% among younger children, age 3 to 10, uh, was slightly lower, at 11.8 percent, and uh, slightly higher among children in poverty, uh, just over 16 percent. Uh, even a better fit for our analysis was the second uh, research report cited here, a 2008 pediatric study 
uh, that looked at data from the early childhood longitudinal study, the third cohort. Uh, th this evaluated children at nine months old and at 24 months old, so right in that zero to three range that, uh, that our research was focused on. Uh, the incidence of developmental delays in this group at 24 months was uh, found to be about 13.8 percent. And once again, that varied uh, by family income. Uh, children in poverty were found to have almost an 18 percent incidence. Uh, those above the poverty level, uh, closer to 12.7 percent. So we took uh, the data from the academic research and overlaid it with our American Community Survey data and estimated that roughly 19,000, just over 19,000 uh, children aged 0 to 3 in Michigan have experienced at least those three or more instances of toxic stress uh, during their early lives. And we also estimated, based on the, uh, the, the research data, uh, that uh, about 65,600, uh, or slightly more than that, uh, children aged 0 to 3 in Michigan uh, would have uh, been experiencing developmental issues at those early ages. Uh, if we look then at our prior factors, poverty, uh, educational attainment, non-English speaking households, and look at an unduplicated count, total, uh, total incidence among Michigan children of at least one of those factors, uh, we estimate in our report that between 41 percent and 56 percent of all children in Michigan aged 0 to 3 experienced at least one of the five risk factors uh, that, we, uh, that we looked at in our, in our study. That's somewhere between 190,000 and 260,000 very young children in Michigan, depending on that, that poverty level that, uh, uh, that, you, uh, that you use uh, to evaluate low income. Further, we, uh, we looked at the prevalence of multiple risk factors uh, among these children. And you'll see on this slide, uh, while uh, about 21 percent of uh, the, ch the at-risk children, 21 uh, percent of all children, I'm sorry, uh, experienced one risk factor, the majority of those who, uh, who were exposed to at least, uh, at least one of the risk factors actually were ex exposed to multiple risk factors. Uh, we see almost uh, 30, uh, uh, 34 percent of the children uh, had two or more risk factors that, uh, that were relevant uh, to them at that young age. So we've now estimated somewhere in the vicinity of 40 to 56 percent of Michigan's youngest children face at least one key risk factor that uh, research suggests inhibit, uh, inhibits kindergarten readiness. The question for policymakers becomes, what should we do? What are some of the best options for state policymakers in addressing some of these issues, some of these challenges for uh, these young children and for their families? Uh, at, our approach was to try to identify promising practices that were, uh, that were backed by sound evidence. And so it, we, we took these steps in trying to identify these promising programs. First, we asked a group of state and national experts, what's working? Uh, where should the states uh, focus additional dollars if they were to make an additional 50, 100 million dollar investment in early childhood intervention programs? Where might a good place to put that be based on, uh, based on research and evidence that's available? After getting the input from those experts, we then turned to, uh, to the academic and empirical research uh, for these programs. What programs could be supported by evidence and from high quality studies, uh, uh, randomized, uh, randomized trials uh, and so forth that showed uh, solid evidence of, uh, of effectiveness. Uh, another factor we looked at as suggested by the, uh, the experts as well was replicability. Uh, we may have program A, whatever it might be, in Chicago uh, and that same programming by name at least in uh, Boston or out east, but those programs might be slightly different. Uh, a key factor was are there models out there, national models, that we could replicate uh, and be certain that there was program fidelity uh, in, uh, in how those programs were actually administered. Um, experts also mentioned other factors, serving the neediest children first, um, engaging parents in those programs, uh, not just providing services to children, but 
but engaging parents in what was happening uh, and then focusing on that cost-benefit relationship demonstrated rate of return for, for those programs. So after talking to the experts and looking at the, uh, the evidence from uh, academic and empirical research, our report uh, focused on four areas for strategic investment. Home visiting programs, uh, access to medical homes and programs that support uh, effective medical homes for young children, uh, promoting high quality child care uh, in Michigan, and piloting a subsidized preschool for three-year-olds, the Great Start Readiness Program, uh, subsidized preschool uh, currently serves four-year-olds. Uh, we looked at uh, the potential benefits of expanding that access to three-year-olds as well. And again, we'll walk through each of these uh, program options uh, one by one in the remaining slides. So first, uh, home visiting programs. What are home visiting programs? Uh, these are programs that link parents with trained service providers, often a nurse or a social worker, for uh, a regular scheduled uh, a uh, set of home visits, often as frequently as we, on a weekly basis. There are voluntary programs. Uh, there are models that support an array of different needs. Some, uh, some uh, focus on uh, children with special needs, uh, parents with financial distress. Uh, some programs uh, are uh, and models focus on children where there have been red flags uh, for potential abuse and neglect in the home. Uh, Across the board, a substantial amount of research has documented the effectiveness of these, of these programs. Uh, in addition, the federal government has made some significant investments in recent years. The Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program is a federal program uh, providing federal funding to states to expand home visiting. Uh, Michigan has recently received some federal funds from this area. In particular, with, with the federal program, 75% of the federal funds are restricted to federally approved evidence-based programs. And the federal government contracted with Mathematica Policy Research, the uh, national think tank, to conduct an independent assessment to determine what national models uh, could be qualified as evidence-based programs. And those evidence-based models from the mathematical research uh, looked at two different things. Math mathematical looked at study design, uh, so uh, what we, not only just research, but high, high or at least moderate quality research using effective tools like randomized uh, control trials, matched comparison groups, um, of, of highly, uh, highly rated, they were evaluated the research design as well as then the, uh, the study outcomes. In, uh, in, in cases, the, the study had to have a high quality of design as well as statistical significance, positive impacts in at least one of eight domain outcomes that they looked at, such as school readiness, family self-sufficiency, health for, uh, uh, for moms and, and children. In Michigan right now, we have four evidence-based models that operate uh, in the state, uh, early Head Start, a healthy Family America, a healthy, healthy Families America, the Nurse Family Partnership, and Parents as Teachers. And in addition, the state has a uh, Medicaid-based maternal infant health program that has not yet achieved the federal evidence-based standard, but uh, uh, has achieved state evidence-based status, uh, which is just minimally, uh, minimally uh, weaker than the, the federal standards. And we understand that the uh, MIHP program also hopes to achieve that federal status very, very soon. If you look at the report, we did a, a fairly significant literature review in this area evaluating the evidence of, of home visiting models uh, in general. Um, there are, uh, we looked specifically at high quality studies as evaluated under the Mathematica, uh, the Mathematica evaluation. And uh, very clearly, there were uh, uh, clear positive outcomes in a number of areas that we, that we cite here in the bullets. Academic, uh, academic skills, reading, math, vocabulary health outcomes not only for moms, or not only for the children, but for moms and uh, reduced mortality rates for those children. Parenting skills, uh, greater self-sufficiency, less reliance on public assistance, uh, actual uh, uh, impacts on arrest and conviction rates uh, for these children as they grew into adults in, in the future. Uh, 
probably some of the most compelling evidence for social programs uh, that that, uh, that you could find were uh, were in the area of home visiting. Uh, one of the issues for home visiting is it, it can be an expensive program. Uh, we uh, we looked uh, at both the cost and the unmet need for home visiting. There is not a lot of uh, information on uh, the current number of children served by the program. Uh, we expect to be getting some reporting on that soon uh, that might uh, fill in the gap in that way. Anecdotal evidence suggests perhaps around 40,000 children in Michigan are currently receiving home visiting services, uh, and by that, uh, under one of the uh, evidence-based uh, evidence-based models, uh, regular uh, long-term home visiting visits. Uh, that compares to the 260,000 at-risk children that we identified in our data analysis using the broader measure of low income. Uh, the programs themselves can vary significantly in cost, anywhere from two, three thousand dollars a year, upwards to nine to twelve thousand dollars a year for the early Head Start program, depending on, and, and that depends on the intensity of the program, uh, the duration of the program. So having looked at home visiting, we looked at effective policy options for, uh, for, for policymakers who might want to expand in this area. Uh, our report suggests that uh, if policymakers want to expand home visiting, they look to provide some grant funding, uh, and specifically grant funding to implement some of these evidence-based home visiting models. Uh, again, the costs vary significantly, but to, to serve an additional 10,000 children could cost in the range of uh, somewhere around $50 million, uh, uh, but again, the, uh, the evidence uh, is very strong that uh, uh, you get a, a healthy return on that investment. Critical to that would be to fund technical assistance. Uh, in particular, as we talked about earlier, these models vary in terms of their emphasis and focus. Um, and so screening children and ensuring that uh, children are, uh, uh, are sent into the most appropriate home visiting model will be very important uh, would be helpful to have uh, a couple different uh, national models operating in, in given areas uh, to take advantage of uh, uh, their helpfulness in terms of uh, different uh, uh, children facing different risks. Uh, also leveraging federal funds, the potential to draw Medicaid dollars for some of the uh, health aspects of home visiting will be very important and that technical assistance to maximize federal dollars uh, could be very critical. A second area of focus in the report was child care. Uh, an older research of an old view of child care uh, saw time in child care as being fairly ambiguous. Uh, and in fact, at worst, there were some studies that suggested a correlation between time and care and certain negative impacts on social behavior for children. That view has changed recently. Uh, studies have begun to use classroom assessment tools to try to rate the quality of the interaction between caregivers and children in the, in the caregiving environment. Uh, and when that has been done, so that high quality and low quality care could be, uh, uh, could be compared and, and uh, evaluated, um, there have been increased findings that high quality care can indeed improve outcomes for children. Uh, we cite two studies here. Our, our report uh, is a, a longer literature review in this area. Uh, both the 2010 study from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development uh, that, that studied high quality care provided to uh, very young children birth to four and a half showed improved cognitive achievement even at age 15. Uh, the increase as, as quality increased, those gains got even higher. So there was a correlation uh, between higher levels of quality and higher levels of gains. And contradicting the traditional view, fewer behavioral and emotional problems with high quality care. Those uh, those findings were duplicated basically in a in a study published in the Early Childhood Research Quarter in 2010, looking at some uh, pre-kindergarten programs in different states. Again, higher levels of social skills, and fewer behavioral problems were found with high quality care, and we uh, and the study showed improved. Uh, and include skills in reading, math, language, and, and other academic skills. So the evidence uh, now exists that high quality care can boost outcomes for children. What's happening in Michigan? 
Michigan does have a child care and development program that provides child care subsidies to uh, primarily low-income households uh, on behalf of children up to age 12. That program serves on, in an average month about 43,000 children currently. Uh, in fiscal year 2013, they had a total cost of $135 million. The state of Michigan has the uh, ability to set its own reimbursement rates to providers. Some of those rates are outlined on the slide in the second bullet. Uh, the state also uh, has the ability to control income eligibility. How high uh, of an income can a household have and remain eligible for uh, those child care subsidies? How does Michigan compare to other states in those areas of reimbursement and in, uh, and in income eligibility? Uh, here, uh, Michigan compares not too favorably in terms of its generosity in, in both areas. The federal government um, suggests, though it does not require states, suggests to states that child care reimbursement be set at a level equivalent to the 75th percentile of a market rate survey that states are to, uh, states are to uh, engage in. In other words, go out and uh, determine how much does center-based care, for instance, cost in Michigan. Well, uh, the Fed suggests set your reimbursement at the state level equivalent to the 75th percentile of that, of that market survey so that the reimbursement is at or exceeds uh, the, the rate charged by 75% of your providers that are out there. Uh, Michigan uh, uh, is seven of the seven Midwestern states that we looked at uh, uh, in terms of this reimbursement level, and, and uh, a nice study was done by uh, the, the sponsored by the Women's Law Center in 2013 that looked at both uh, reimbursement and this income limit. Michigan was last among the, uh, the the seven states that were part of that survey. Michigan's uh, rate for child care, uh, center-based care, one-year-olds, for instance, was 65 percent of that federal benchmark, whereas, for instance, Pennsylvania's uh, they ranked first in the Midwest, was virtually 100% at that 75th percentile. Uh, the same was true for the income limit. Uh, Michigan ranked sixth of the seven Midwestern states uh, that we drew data on from the uh, National Women's Law Center survey, uh, exceeding only Ohio. And when we look nationally uh, for reimbursement, Michigan was second to last uh, nationally above only Missouri in their reimbursement levels and was above only three states, Missouri, Ohio, and Nebraska nationally in terms of that income threshold. Furthermore, the caseloads and spending in the, for this particular program have plunged in recent years. Uh, there are probably two reasons for that. Uh, first, of course, we experienced the severe Great Recession, uh, and as fewer people, uh, fewer parents work, uh, work is the primary criteria uh, used to gain eligibility for child care uh, support. Uh, that clearly had an impact. Uh, just as significantly, perhaps even more significantly, there were some very negative audit findings for this program in uh, around 2008 uh, that questioned the um, payment integrity in the program, uh, suggested perhaps we were making mispayments to uh, child care providers who did not deliver uh, services to a certain child and yet they were receiving payment for those services. Uh, there were some compliance uh, requirements that were stepped up as a result of that audit. Um, that certainly probably curtailed the, the missed payments, but it appears that perhaps it's also caused some providers uh, to leave the program and decide that it wasn't worth their while to, to participate. Uh, if you look at the data, Michigan spent over $415 million in fiscal year 2007 on child care subsidies. By fiscal year 2013, that was down to $135 million, so about a 70, I'm sorry, a 67 percent decline in spending in this area. And that means then uh, access, to care, access to quality care, uh, already low reimbursement rates, uh, already low income thresholds uh, makes it even harder for uh, families who do need high quality care to, to uh, obtain that care. We tried to put a rough estimate on unmet need in this area. Again, uh, recent data from the Department of Human Services suggests that uh, at any point in time this program is, is ser uh, serving about uh, 
19,292 children from birth to age three, those very young children. That's based on April 2014 reporting. Again, our estimates, as we looked at the American Community Survey data, looking at both the risk factors, uh, outside of children that had both at least one risk factor and whose parents were, both parents were engaged in employment, there were between 108,000 and 145,000 children who uh, demonstrated both of those needs. Parents worked and were at risk compared to only slightly less than 20,000 being served under the current program. Uh, high quality child care is costly, so we, we try to put some estimates on, well, what might it take to, uh, to help meet some of this unmet need. If we raise reimbursement rates in Michigan uh, to the uh, federal benchmarks for children zero to three, that could cost any, uh, up to about $73 million. If we, uh, if we not only raise those reimbursement rates to the benchmarks, but also restored the caseload, restored that uh, heavy drop off in, uh, in, in children served uh, and went back to 2005 peak levels, uh, the cost would be much higher, uh, up, upwards to perhaps $400 million. So um, very expensive, but we're down about to more than $200 million in spending in this area. So our report does uh, suggest that policymakers look to child care and look to potentially reinvest in uh, high quality child care. Um, one effective way to do that would be continue to uh, would be to continue to expand investment in quality-based tiered reimbursement. Michigan has a great start to quality uh, child care rating system on the ground now that's currently being evaluated and, and validated uh, within some uh, work that's ongoing. And uh, an effective strategy would be to uh, target investment towards uh, providers who have achieved some minimal level of quality uh, under, the, under the child care rating system. The rating system awards star level quality. A child care provider could get two stars, three stars, five stars, depending on how it does in the evaluation. If that, if that child care rating system can be validated and, and show that uh, high quality care is indeed in Michigan correlating to uh, positive outcomes for children, then investing in uh, and in targeting the investment to to uh, providers that, for instance, achieve at least three stars in the quality rating system uh, may be an effective op option. We estimated the cost, at, uh, current cost, at between 15 and $20 million, uh, at least initially, if reimbursement rates were increased to the federal benchmarks for three-star or higher rated programs. That would go up over time as additional programs qualified at the three-star or higher level, hopefully significantly. As as we uh, incentivize more providers to provide high quality care. But that may be an effective uh, financial option in terms of this investment. Uh, another important aspect of this, very quickly, is to fund an awareness campaign as well for, uh, for the rating system. Uh, there's a program called Get Great Start Connect. It's very important that parents uh, who are making uh, uh, child care decisions are aware of uh, and utilize the, uh, the, the child care uh, rating system's results. Uh, and, and so it would also be helpful to uh, fund awareness uh, campaigns for, uh, for that parent outreach. Another, uh, another area that uh, we looked at were medical homes for children. Uh, our uh, expert interviews and, and research suggested there was a critical link between early experiences of children and lifelong uh, health outcomes. Uh, and medical homes for children, children assisted in uh, helping at-risk children overcome some of the challenges. What is a medical home for children? It's, it's what, uh, in part, what most of us think of as, as a medical home. And an ongoing relationship with a primary care physician. That physician coordinates care, uh, looks at uh, all health needs for the patient, um, for children, um, research suggests it's important to have two-generation focus as well that focuses on the child's health, but also supports parents in being sort of that primary, first-line health care provider for the child. Uh, in terms of maintaining a medical home relationship, um, also clearly there are challenges for at-risk families, any family, but particularly at-risk families. Uh, it's not only difficult to navigate the health care system and to get access to a high-quality provider, 
but other barriers for uh, lower income households or non-English speaking households might exist. Transportation, getting my child to an appointment, language barriers, uh, other uh, challenges that face uh, at-risk families. Uh, research has demonstrated that, uh, that medical homes are helpful uh, both for the patients and uh, but also for the healthcare system in general. Uh, we again did a literature review in the report. Uh, families with medical homes, children with medical homes show lower emergency room use, uh, more well care use. Um, increased outcomes for adults, particularly those with particular, uh, particular health risks. Uh, overall reductions in health care spending. And then for children in particular, uh, research has borne out uh, improved rates of vaccination, uh, reduced unmet uh, health needs, and even increased healthy behavior in the homes, more parents reading to children as an example. In our research, we found there are, there are programs that can help um, to maximize the existence and effectiveness of, of medical homes for young children in Michigan. And a model program that we looked at is the Children's Health Care Access Program, often called CHAP, uh, which initially was originated in Kent County in 2008. And CHAP is a partnership between uh, local Medicaid health plans, local medical providers, and other partners focusing on uh, Medicaid enrolled children. Uh, it provides uh, families with educational uh, care and education uh, resources as well as the care management that, uh, that comes with a medical home. Uh, providers are also uh, provided technical assistance to help ensure a strong medical home environment for, for their patients. Uh, the system itself, health plans in the area provided enhanced reimbursement incentives uh, to providers for their participation. Uh, a central component of CHAP was a team of uh, medical professionals, nurses, community health workers, social workers, uh, behavioral health navigators, uh, who provided services both uh, in English and in Spanish uh, to provide wraparound services, uh, referrals to community services, maybe transportation, for instance, um, uh, provided technical assistance to parents in, uh, in making sure their child was having health needs met. Uh, that Kent County model was expanded and, and replicated in Wayne County in 2011, um, and there were ongoing efforts in nine other counties uh, to do the same. Unfortunately, some, uh, some funding through the Early Childhood Investment Corporation was discontinued. Many of those county uh, efforts now are uh, in limbo uh, as, a, as a result of uh, the lack of uh, funding going forward. When we looked at the Kent County CHAP program, uh, it's a program that covered 18,000 uh, Medicaid-eligible children. Uh, our look at some of the financials suggested that uh, the program provided those direct consultation wraparound services to around 2,000 children at a cost of roughly $224 per child. Uh, and we went and looked uh, in, the, in the study at unmet need in Michigan for medical homes. Uh, recent survey evidence suggests over a third of children from birth to age five lack a medical home. Uh, that same data then, if we look at the population of zero to three children, suggests that perhaps as many as 95,000 children aged zero to three do not have a medical home uh, in, uh, in Michigan. The Kent and Wayne County CHAT programs covered an estimated 10,750 children in that zero to three range. So again, that suggests a, a pretty healthy uh, gap and unmet need in the vicinity of maybe 84,000 children. So we recommended uh, as an effective option for policymakers in the area of providing medical homes for children an expansion of these types of uh, chat type programs that would effectively increase the number of children not only with access to a medical home but with an effective medical home relationship. Um, we think policymakers should consider if, uh, if they wish to expand access to medical homes providing matching grants uh, to assist communities in creating and running CHAP-like programs. Uh, given the financial information out of Kent County in terms of about $224 per child as being the cost of those tangible wraparound services, it's estimated that 
to provide those same types of services to all Medicaid eligible children, zero to 18, uh, it could be as low as $10 million statewide. Uh, that's a lot of money, but in the context of the state budget, uh, that's, uh, that's a very doable number. We also emphasize creating a resource center to provide technical assistance to learn from what's worked in Kent County, to learn from uh, what's worked in Wayne County uh, as well, um, and, and allow those uh, new communities to, uh, uh, to model uh, their programs after the successful uh, programs in Kent and Wayne counties. So finally, uh, in our uh, conversations with experts, there was some talk about the uh, a potential for expanding eligibility for a Great Start Readiness program uh, to three-year-olds. Uh, currently, the program serves four-year-old youth. Uh, there was uh, some suggestion that uh, three-year-olds are sort of in a hole. It's post-home visiting. Um, it's before they're eligible for high-quality uh, pre-kindergarten uh, pre programs. Um, perhaps uh, three-year-olds would benefit by that extra year in, in Michigan's high-quality pre-kindergarten program. Uh, the research on this was a, a, on, on including three-year-olds in preschool, it was a little mixed, uh, uh, often showing initial benefits but no consensus on whether those benefits persisted over time. Uh, our research was, uh, we did find one study from New Jersey uh, at the uh, Abbott Preschool a uh, 2013 study by the National Institute of Early Education Research, uh, which did a fifth grade follow-up on participants in that New Jersey program that did, did indeed show increased cognitive achievement skills and persistent benefits, uh, more persistent benefits for those that started at age three. Uh, so this, uh, this one program, uh, this one study was very intriguing. Um, however, uh, we do acknowledge in the report the research is, is somewhat mixed on this. Uh, as a result, um, given the, the, the promising uh, results from New Jersey, uh, if policymakers want to look to preschool for three-year-olds, we suggest piloting a, a preschool program for three-year-olds and then carefully evaluating those results from a, from a cost-benefit standpoint. Um, assuming that uh, we have a per-student cost it, for three-year-olds, it's similar to the cost for four-year-olds, about $3,600 per slot. Um, a subsidized preschool program for 5,000 three-year-olds could be provided at an annual cost of around $18 million. So with that, those were, uh, that's a quick review of some of the policy options that, uh, that we put forth in our recent report. I thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we do have time for some questions, and I will turn it back to Eric to see if we have some questions to come in. But thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Bob. As I mentioned at the beginning, for those who joined us late, we're going to stick around as long as there's questions lined up. So uh, I know the, the invitation said about an hour. We'll stick around as long as needed to uh, address these. So the first one, uh, Bob, is about the... Uh, stuff you presented at the beginning, you referred then and once in a while throughout the later slides uh, to say the neediest children. Uh, how would that standard be measured? How would you define who are the neediest children? It, that would probably depend on, uh, on the specific program. We did not actually uh, uh, define that specifically in, in our numbers. But I think probably the best reference uh, would be looking at the, the slide um, on the incidence uh, and uh, prevalence of multiple risk factors that we looked at earlier. In fact, maybe I'll quickly go back to that slide uh, for the benefit of those who can see it. Um, you know, we do have uh, many, uh, many children in the state who not only are experiencing one risk factor, but uh, two, three, sometimes even four risk factors. Um, if you're talking home visiting, if you're uh, talking um, uh, high quality child care, how you measure that, the neediest children may differ a little bit, but in general, I would say those with at least two or more of those risk factors uh, you know, uh, would have greater need than uh, uh, you know, those facing a single risk factor. 
but it would depend a bit on the program and would probably be specific to, to each of these uh, each of these programs uh, depending on which uh, which ones policymakers decide to tackle. Bob, you listed a number of different programs, four different programs. Is the idea of the research that these should all be done at once, or uh, did the, the report try to set them up individually? What would be the the benefits or the uh, the downside of doing it together or doing them? Well, I think we were cognizant of the budget realities of uh, the fact that uh, you know, we may not have sufficient uh, dollars up front to do all of these at once. Um, we also uh, did not prescribe a specific roadmap as to which should be first or second uh, or third. What we did do was try to look at or if we're, if we're going to take that next step for early childhood programs, what programs should we look to first? And it is these four programs in, in, in our eye. Um, I do think that uh, we found the most compelling evidence uh, on home visiting. I think it's, it's very clear that home visiting has the strongest uh, link between empirical research that can show that if you do this, you get positive results down the road, that they're persistent, that they last into adulthood. Uh, I do think it's pretty clear that home visiting probably has the strongest evidence in that way. But for policymakers, um, th this is sort of a guy that we've given you three or four options to turn to for that next tier of investment. We think that they should look to these programs first as the most evidence-based uh, and, uh, and then you know, move ahead as they see fit. But it, our, our goal, again, was to try to identify areas for policymakers that they could turn to and say, we know if we make this investment, um, there's empirical support for results in, in these areas. What What is it about the Kent County CHAP program that makes an attractive option for CRC in terms of policy? You know, I think it's, it's that it, is, it has worked in, uh, in Kent County, uh, and it also is a, it appears to be a very cost-effective program. Uh, if you can serve, uh, I will say it probably does not have, for instance, the evidence base um, in terms of uh, in terms of multiple uh, of research reports that can that can show. Uh, uh, you know, clear, clear results. So it probably doesn't quite have the evidence base of, for instance, home visiting, but um, it does have. This comes out of a model that was run in Colorado that's been successful. I think we now have evidence that Kent County is successful. And when you can uh, improve uh, medical outcomes for children and by providing wraparound services that can cost just a couple hundred dollars per child to provide. Um, that was compelling to us, and I think we we found the bang for the buck uh, with expansion of a chat program uh, to to be very effective. Something that could be replicated uh, at uh, a, a doable cost, and, and appears to have pretty clear uh, evidence that it's worked uh, in, in in two places now. Why isn't early on mentioned as part of this study? Uh, early on is a is a program that uh, helps uh, uh, helps identify uh, uh, special needs uh, children. It, it, it is operational in Michigan. I think we certainly looked at early on. Uh, I think there were some discussions with uh, uh, you know experts, our national and state experts. Um, talked about early on. I think the reason that it's not in this report is the evidence uh, on its effectiveness was a less compelling to our experts and in the academic research than uh, than the programs that did that did make the report. I I should be. I guess we should note we tried to pick 
the areas where there's the most compelling evidence of a return on investment. Um, certainly that does not mean that there are other good programs out there that, that can also be effective. Uh, we try to uh, identify those programs that have the greatest promise for, uh, for policymakers in our minds. I, I would hate to think that anyone would think that the not being in this means a program is necessarily a bad, a bad thing. Uh, so uh, early on and other, and the other good programs that are out there uh, just didn't reach the standard that these other programs did. You uh, talked about most of the numbers in terms of um, the number of children and the cost of these programs in a statewide perspective. Has the report broken them down into what it would cost in Detroit or Flint or Grand Rapids or some of our other big cities where we know uh, high numbers of what we've called the neediest children are tend to be uh, centralized in, in greater level. We, that, that our, our, our thought and, and hope was to do a little of the geographic um, comparisons uh, in terms of the at need population. Poverty, you know, low income uh, and uh, poverty levels are certainly a key driver to that. And so. The, the questioner is, is correct. He, certainly, you're going to see a, a much greater incidence of that need youth in, in some of our poor urban areas and rural areas as well, perhaps, uh, among this, uh, you know, among that population. We did not, because of our use of the American Community Survey and how uh, the data is reported there, uh, we did not, at least yet, find a, a we have not reported any as data by county, for instance, which we would have liked to have done. Um, so unfortunately, as of right now at least, uh, we, we did not break the data out into any geographic uh, uh, ranges within the state. But uh, clearly, you're correct. Uh, where there is uh, a higher incidence of uh, poverty uh, in, in children in poverty, uh, that's uh, likely where the, the, uh, the at-risk population is going to all right, so I think that wraps up our webinar. We've gone through all the questions that have been posed to us. I want to thank everyone for attending. Remind them that the report is available on our website at crcmich.org, crcmich.org. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted. Uh, we'll put it on YouTube and link to it on our website. Uh, hopefully by the end of today, if not uh, very early tomorrow, it should be available uh, so you can refer others to um, what you've learned today and uh, hopefully we can continue to push this report forward. Thank you again and have everyone have a great evening.